Okay, so the main, main question is how and why are, how do we reconstruct uh, the history of Mars, the geological history of Mars, and why? Why would we be interested in knowing what happened in the history of Mars's geology? Why do we want to reconstruct that? Not a rhetorical question. What do we know about Mars today? We don't know a lot about Mars today. Um, can't really term the range for like the number of craters in one area. That's what we'll be looking at today in the lab part. Okay. So, in terms of, of geology and trying to understand the geology of an area, we really need to understand how that area came to be. Like, in, if you're talking about New York State and trying to understand the geology of New York State, you really have to understand, you know, glacial processes because glaciers have had a you know, major role in, in, uh, in developing the landscape of New York State, uh, tectonic processes. I mean, why do we have finger lakes? Why do we have all of this very distinct top topographic region in New York that looks like an accordion that got squished together? Because it's essentially like an accordion that got squished together. So by understanding the geological history of an area, we can better understand why we see the landforms that we uh, see in an area, how they got to be there. This has implications for the kinds of mineral structure, uh, mineral resources you'd find in an area. I mean, clearly the hydrology of New York State uh, and the, you know, the river systems, lakes and so forth have been very prominently influenced by the geological history that the state has gone through. We want to do the same thing to understand Mars as well. Okay, so basically it's important to tell time be able to say this part of the landscape is older come on back and this part of the landscape is younger and there's a couple of main ways we can we can do that one is through just relative dating and I won't make any snide jokes about relative dating um, this is basically What's younger, what's older? Like that view on the left hand side is what famous national park? Grand Canyon. Okay. So what do you see when you're looking at that picture? You see a canyon, but what else? So the red is iron, does that mean it's older? You're looking at which? The picture. Okay, so Well, maybe there are some other things that could lead to, but we've got a distinct coloration there. Oh, see layers. See layers. Okay, so there's layers here, here, you know, here. If we had a more close-up view, we would see a bunch of layers. The higher-up layers are younger than the one below it. Okay, basically, pretty, pretty common, uh, pretty safe assumption is when you see a stack of layers in the landscape, uh, the younger layers on top and the older layers on the bottom. In the case of the Grand Canyon, uh, and this is dangerous because I'm doing this off the top of my head, there's probably about two billion years of Earth history, if I remember correctly, uh, that, that is encompassed in the layers of the Grand Canyon. And so, uh, you know, biologists are very interested because we see different kinds of fossil assemblages the deeper we go in the canyon. And, and that, that relative dating allows us to say, well, these kinds of biological communities occurred earlier and these occurred later. But relative dating just gives you that kind of what's younger, what's older. We don't know, and early geologists didn't know, is that are the older sections of the Grand Canyon 100,000 years old? Are they you know, millions of years old? Or are they billions of years old as we know now? So we want to generally combine this 
relative approach to d telling the difference ages with uh, some technique that gives us a way to put absolute times on the different landscapes, on the different strata, the different layers in a geological formation, the different rocks that we would maybe pull out from some area. On Earth, our best absolute dating technique is to look at the decay of radioactive elements, ra radiometric dating. Um, there are lots of different uh, isotopes that could be used. If you're looking at biological materials that aren't very old, that, that an archaeologist would like to look at, you can look at the decay of radioactive carbon-14 to become carbon-12. Carbon uh, we can look at the decay of radioactive potassium to become non-radioactive argon over time, over billions of years. Uh, radioactive isotopes of uranium will decay to lead. So there's lots of different uh, elements that can be used. But the key feature for something that can provide an absolute date, we don't have a we don't have a analog clock here in the morning in, anymore. But imagine there were a clock up here with a second hand ticking around the minutes that you're sitting here listening to me. How does that second hand allow us to tell time? How can we tell that 15 seconds has elapsed? It's quarter of the way around the clock. So we can see a change. We can measure a certain amount of change. But the other key factor is that we know the way clocks are built that that second hand is sweeping around at a constant rate. So if we know anything that occurs at a constant rate and we can measure how much that has happened, we can take that amount that has happened and and you know, add in the rate at which that occurs and figure out how much time has elapsed. So in the case of radiometric decay, we know the constant rates at which radioactive elements decay. If we can measure how much decay has occurred, then we can tell how old the rock is. Uh, if we know how fast the, the second hand is moving around and we know how far the second hand has moved, we can calculate the amount of time that has elapsed. We'll be doing the same thing Sort of with a crater counting lab, if we can assume that craters develop at a fairly constant rate due to bombardment, and we can measure how much crater formation has taken place, then we can say, you know, how rel relatively and absolutely speaking, how old a particular area is. Okay. Just quickly in terms of this relative dating, there are oftentimes... There are many questions where we just want to know what's older or what's younger, and we want to be able to reconstruct the, uh, the history of a given uh, landscape. There are these six or so techniques that we can use to reconstruct how a particular landscape has developed. We've kind of already talked about the first one, if you look here in this first part of the diagram, what we're looking at is the, a, a part of a body of water here. That's what this blue part represents. And what you see is layers of sediment that have built up at the bottom of this, let's say, ocean. And again, which layers do we expect to be the youngest? Not a tough question, guys. The top. Because generally speaking, layers of sediment are going to be put down on top of what's already there. Okay? There's not very many mechanisms that allow us to build layers of stuff underneath a pre-existing uh, bedrock. Okay, so that's, that's superposition. Uh, lateral, horizontal, Horizontality, original horizontality and lateral continuity basically also relate to these, these layers. We kind of assume that 
under most normal conditions, these layers are laid down fairly horizontally. Uh, those horizontal layers may later be tilted up, but initially we expect the layers to be mostly laid down horizontally, maybe at a slight angle if you're talking about a river coming into an ocean and, and depositing sediments out at the mouth of that river. But generally speaking, we don't build up new layers of rock in a vertical kind of format. If you uh, were driving through the hills and looking at the geology, and you saw one layer here at the base of both of these hills that looked to be kind of continuous between the two, and you saw let's say some sandstone at the next layer up, what would you expect to see at the next layer up on the adjacent hillside? Or if you saw a layer of sandstone on this adjacent hillside, how would you interpret that? Why do these two hills both put a layer of sandstone on top of the bedrock below them? I guess you get it for at some time they were flat. Okay. Yeah, the sediment flow up from the bedrock. Precisely. So our, our most natural interpretation would be that the layers built up in kind of a flat mesa and then something occurred to erode away in between, cutting away this, this missing part that used to be there, but erosion has, has removed it. So that's this idea of lateral continuity. Um, Cross-cutting, if we... Well... I don't think I want to take the time uh, to go into cross-cutting and inclusions in detail, but these are ways of looking at what might happen to those layers later on uh, and uh, that will adjust this kind of regular uh, layers. But the point is, through these uh, ways of different interpretations of what's going on in the landscape, we can kind of build up the history of this uh, given area. Okay, here's just a more uh, realistic kind of view that we would see if we were analyzing a particular landscape here on Earth. Uh, how do you explain, or how might you explain um, this layer of material here that seems to be kind of similar to a layer of material that's down here? If these layers initially built up as a series of layers with this kind of unique layer being laid down at this point, why are they not continuous? What might have gone on here? Okay, so if there is some kind of an earthquake or a rupture of the, uh, of the bedrock, then you might see this kind of displacement. So, you know, a way to kind of interpret this view would be that you had initially uh, these layers of bedrock being laid down and maybe there was an, an uh, ocean for a while that laid down a different uh, type of sediment. So the initial development in this area is the, the development of these sedimentary layers which then uh, some earthquake happened to cause that abrupt break and dislocation of the of those layers. This intrusion of material, say this volcanic or material that kind of intruded into the bedrock here, did that occur before or after the earthquake? After. Would have had to happen after. So picture that 
diagram without that intrusion, with just the layers that are offset from the earthquake, that would have been kind of um, a stage early in this process. Later on, uh, we have this volcanic material coming up through, uh, and because it's intruding across that, that break, um, you can tell that it obviously had to have happened after the earthquake. That kind of approach allows us to build up a relative uh, sequence of events. The whole area might have eventually then been eroded away. You know, maybe a glacier came along and scraped off all of the layers down to a certain level. And then we have, after that, additional layers building up. Again, more, uh, more original horizontal horizontality and superposition with erosion coming in later on and removing some of the layers, that kind of process over and over again can lead to the kinds of complicated landscapes we see here on the Earth. Now imagine trying to do this when what you're doing is viewing Mars from either orbit or from a handful of rovers that are going around the surface. That's what geologists are working with currently on Mars. Okay. These Processes of relative and absolute dating have allowed us to build up a geological time scale for the Earth. No need to talk about this in detail, but you know, the, basically we're talking about you know, Precambrian age, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Those kinds of major periods in Earth's history are represented in the rocks and represented in the fossils and allow us to build up history of the geology and life on Earth. We want to do the same thing on Mars. <clears throat> okay, so here is the kind of image we might see uh, looking down on a particular area of Mars from orbit. This is Elysium Planitia. Um, So, the first step would be, what do you actually observe in this picture? Someone on the left side of the room. You see craters. Is, is craters an observation or an interpretation? What do you actually see? See round structures. Okay, so let's uh, start noting this. We see some round structures, which uh, could be craters, but what else makes round structures? Hills, uh, not so much these kinds of round structures. Well, the craters could be impact craters, or they could be volcanic craters. Okay. So the observation is we've got these round structures. They look uh, like they're depressions in, so in the side, and um, our interpretation might be impact craters, might be volcanic craters. We see uh, some darker material. Where, where do you see that? So you're talking about this, okay. So we see a difference in the lightness and darkness. That's something we can observe. Uh, what else can we observe? These round structures that we think might be impact craters. Do the densities of them differ between the dark area that was identified versus the light area? In what way? Okay, so fewer, fewer craters, and I'm just going to go ahead and say craters in the dark area. Um, 
If we look at uh, one of these craters, these circular structures in more detail, uh, what do you see in terms of light and shadow on um, uh, around this crater? Okay, deeper, a little bit of an interpretation. What do you actually see in terms of the intensity of the light being picked up by the camera? Okay, you've got, uh, you've got kind of a lightish gray here, but what about here on this? That's the even brightest, right? And here we have dark. And I'm really making a mess of the, of the image there, but... Uh, the source of light is coming from one direction. Okay. We uh, would know when the spacecraft was flying over this area and when the picture was taken, what direction the light was coming from, and uh, what direction what would you expect that light to be coming from? What did you say? Uh, from, like, off the left. Yeah. Uh, it's the direction of the sunlight is essentially this way. So this darkness here would represent what? Have I obscured it too much? If you look at the left side of this crater, there is, it's very bright on this side, and it's dark on this side of the edge. Uh, it would be like the, the ridge of the crater has a shadow in the center. Okay. So craters generally have rims. And if the light is coming in from the left, the outside of that left side of the crater is going to be lit up by the sunlight. And immediately on the inside of the crater, there's going to be a shadow. And so when you see that lightness and, and darkness you know, that's a clear indication that we do have a raised rim there. If you look at the right side of the crater, the interior wall is bright, and the exterior wall is somewhat dark. Again, the rim of the crater casting a shadow. So we're, we're sort of bleeding in now to interpretation, but, uh, but that's okay. So uh, light and shadow are important observations to make when trying to interpret these pictures. I would kind of add that it looks to me like the surface is smoother in the dark area. So it seems to be seems to be smoother in here. It seems to be more rough terrain over here. Um, and then if you really want to be, um, you know, look at all the observations you can get out of here, uh, if you look at the, the um, dark structures coming out of these craters, it looks like there's, you know, wind-blown material uh, coming out. Okay, so if we uh, wanted to interpret this, we could say that that dark, smooth area in the middle is potentially and probably a lava flow that flowed out over that um, rougher, lighter terrain that's surrounding the edge of the picture. So. Given uh, the principle of superposition, which occurred, which is a younger landscape, where the lava is or where the lava isn't? Where the lava is. Where the lava is. Okay, so then we have this area full of craters. We have uh, lava flowing out over the top of it, uh, providing a younger surface. 
Initially, how many craters would there have been on that lava flow? If the lava flow is deep enough to fill in all of the craters in the terrain down below, you would initially start off with a blank slate. Uh, if you look at the edges of the lava flow, you can kind of see that on this side we have some bright edges and on this side we have some dark edges that would be very consistent with the lava flow being raised up above the surrounding plain and uh, catching the sunlight on the side that this, the sun's rays are coming in and producing a shadow here on this side. Okay, okay I'm going to do a bunch of this. What we're going to be working on today is using um, this JMARS tool that I had you sign up for an account for in order to look at some different areas and actually count craters uh, on some real Mars data to be able to provide an estimate of how old those areas are that you're looking at. Now the way this works If we had a brand new lava flow, for example, um, what's going to happen to that lava flow over time? It's going to cool. Okay, let's say it's cooled. We've got basically a lava plain that's sitting there on the surface of Mars. The you know, wind's going to be blowing over it. There's clearly not going to be any rainfall on current day Mars. Uh, we'll talk about in the past, but this plane's going to be sitting there. Okay. Mars is a target sitting out in the solar system just like the moon and the earth are. And there's going to be a particular rate at which any area on Mars gets smacked by incoming objects. And we know uh, for a variety of reasons that the smaller impactors are relatively common and larger impactors are relatively rare. So over time, you know, just kind of a random process, we might have, boom, Mars gets hit by a small impactor. And a little bit later, it gets hit again, and a little bit larger one, another small one. And, you know, these would be kind of randomly distributed. I'm not very good at drawing random because we're, none of us are. But, you know, there's going to be a variety of maybe some, a lot of smaller ones because they're more common. Maybe some medium-sized ones. This is what a younger landscape would look like. Uh, over time, um, what's going to happen? It's going to get more and more of them. Right? And then every now and then, you know, something large might come down from the sky and produce a larger... Okay. So as the area gets older and older, the number of impact craters in general is going to increase. There's always going to be more smaller impact craters than large ones. A surface that is relatively young, since the large impactors are rare, may not have any large impactors. The older a surface gets, the greater the likelihood that you're going to see a large impact crater in the area. Uh, so this kind of approach is used on the moon, on Mars, on uh, Mercury, many of the moons of Jupiter to identify what are the old surfaces and what are the young surfaces. There's a lot of math involved uh, to explain why we see the particular shapes we see. I'm not going to bore you with any of that. 
But generally speaking, if you count craters in an area, and you look at the number of small ones, medium-sized ones, large ones, you will tend to get uh, a, a plot of the density of craters versus the size that looks something like this. Okay? Um, at a given age, really large craters are going to be rare, and the smaller the size of crater you're looking at, the more abundant they're going to tend to be, the higher the density. This is kind of the, the pattern that we'll be looking for in the lab today. Okay, so here's where I'm going to cut this presentation off because I want us to have plenty of time to actually work with the, the tools. What we, <coughs> or what people who use these crater counts do in order to determine how old a particular piece of Mars is, is for that given area, count up the number of craters that are in different size categories and calculate the density and basically you can create a line from that and the further off up and to the right that line is the older the terrain is. If we look at something a part of Mars that's relatively young a million years old which you need to start thinking a million years that's actually not that old Generally speaking, the crater curve would fall something along here. Um, so this density is a logarithmic scale, so we've got um, one crater per square kilometer, a tenth of a crater per square kilometer, a hundredth of a crater versus ten versus a hundred. Okay. So, um, for this area of Mars that's a million years old, why do we have a higher density of small craters than large craters? Uh, larger impactors are less common, so... Generally speaking, you're going to find a lot more small craters than large craters. Okay. If you imagine, if you think about the rocks that have hit the Earth, you know, it takes you know, hundreds of millions of years to get something as large as the impactor that killed off the dinosaurs. But you know, just two years ago, there was a big rock that blew up in the sky over, the, over Russia, right? Anybody remember that? Okay. So... Um, rocks of that size actually hit the earth on a regular basis. Most of the time they, lay, they come in over the ocean and nobody pays attention. But when one comes in over the city uh, in Russia and everyone has their dashboard cams on because they're concerned about their car being carjacked or whatever, then you see all of these cool pictures of this fireball coming across the sky. That's relatively small. Uh, something a little bit larger, like the um, uh, Tunguska explosion in 1908, that flattened hundreds of kilometers of forest in eastern Siberia, killed a few people, killed a lot of uh, wildlife. You know, those that's relatively larger and relatively rare. You know, maybe something like that size comes in every few centuries. Um, so that's why we have this kind of relationship. Now, if you're talking about an older surface, like this surface that's a billion years old, what we see are, at every size of impact, the older surface has a higher density, which is what you'd expect been around longer, 
It's had longer time to be, be smacked by things coming in from space. And this um, younger surface basically has, in this case, no impactors greater than 8 kilometers, no craters greater than 8 kilometers in diameter. Why no big, large impacts in this surface that's only, that's a million years old? Again, something that large to create a creator that is greater than 8 kilometers in size is so rare that it's unlikely to have shown up in that million year time period. But if you talk about a billion years, which is a thousand times a million, then you have much more time for those large, infrequent, uh, but very destructive impactors to come in. Uh, 